morning. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, we are so thankful for your prayers, for your support for our campus ministry, RUF International at Johns Hopkins. Um, I bring copies of our spring semester newsletter, uh, highlighting some of the things we did, including the zip line at RVR. Um, some of you, if you were there, uh, your pictures might be there in the newsletter. So if you would like to pick up a um, copy of the newsletter after the worship service is right here at the front. Um, Let's turn your Bible to John chapter 17, verse 1 to 13. John 17, verse 1 to 13. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture may be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This is the word of God. So my name is Jacob. It is of Hebrew origin, and the meaning of Jacob is a supplanter, he who supplants. A supplanter is someone who takes the place of someone else with a purpose. Jacob also means he who grabs the heel. In the Bible, Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And they were twins, and Esau came out first, and Jacob came out next with his hand holding Esau's heel. That's why he got the name Jacob, he who grabs the heel. Uh, my last name, Jason, is spelled J-A-S-I-N. It is a form of Jason, J-A-S-O-N. And Jason is a, is a form of Joshua. It is also of Hebrew origin. Joshua means the Lord is my salvation. So my last name, Jason, means the Lord is my salvation. My, my complete name, Jacob, Jason, means that the Lord is my savior, my supplanter. He took my place on the cross for me. He is the one who grabs my heel and says, I go to the cross for you. You stay here. The Lord saved me and died for me. The Lord is my savior. So have you studied the meaning of your given name and your family name? If you have not, there is a tool that can help you. It's called Google. <laughs> Jesus Christ loved his people so much he knows us by name Isaiah 43 verse 1 says fear not for I have redeemed you I have called you by name you are mine now when you say that someone is yours either your spouse or children or even your pet you love that someone and when Jesus said to you you are mine he really means what he says. He has redeemed you on the cross to show how much he loves you. 
You are his and he is yours. In this broken world, we have so many troubles. My, my heart was moved hearing the prayer that many of you have health issues. And there are many times that we wonder, does Jesus know my struggle? Um, does he care about me? We know that the answer is yes, but we struggle with this deep inside our hearts because we cannot see whether Jesus is really doing anything, even though he has said, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Here, John 17 is known as the high priestly prayer. Jesus put out his heart to his heavenly father and he prayed for his people, for us, for you. He prayed his prayer in the night before he went to the cross to carry our cross to redeem us. It was not his cross that he carried, but our cross. And in his prayer, Jesus reveals his heart to us and his love for us. His disciples heard this prayer because Jesus prayed this prayer before them, and he prayed for all his disciples, past, present, and future, so including all of us here. There are seven things that Jesus wants us to know about in his prayer here. Seven things. Number one, Jesus wants us to know that he is the Son of God who loves us. This is in verse 1. Jesus wants us to know that he is the Son of God who loves us. Verse 1 tells us, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. So Jesus wants us to know him well, who he is, what he has done for us, and what he always does for us. Here, Jesus wants us to know that he is the Son of God. He and the Father have a loving relationship from eternity. He is about to be separated from his Father because he's going to bear our cross and die for the punishment of all our sins as our substitute. Now think about this, the longer the relationship we have with someone, the deeper our love for that person. The shorter the relationship we have with someone, the, the less love we have for that person, so not very deep. So if you have a deep loving relationship with someone and that relationship is broken, it hurts so deeply. The deeper the relationship, the deeper the scar and the wound. Now, the relationship that Jesus has with the Father is an eternal, no beginning, unmeasurable, and deeper than the ocean, deeper than the universe. So when God the Father turned his back on him on the cross and cut off their relationship, it was hell that Jesus experienced. His suffering on the cross is as deep as his loving relationship with the Father. It was hell that Jesus took for us, and he wants us to know that he is the Son of God who loves us, who died for us, and who took hell for us so that we can be saved. Number two, Jesus wants us to know that he has authority over all flesh and has given us eternal life. This is in verse 2 and 3. Jesus wants us to know that he has authority over all flesh and has given us eternal life. In verse 2, Jesus said to the Father, You have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So Jesus Christ has received authority over all people, the whole humanity. And he said the same thing after his resurrections before he went back to heaven. In Matthew 28, in his great commissions for all his people, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus wants us to know that he has authority over all people, all nations in this world. It means that he is the Lord of all people. And there is nobody in this world whom we need to be afraid of because Jesus Christ is Lord over all people. There is nobody who can hurt us and there is nothing bad that can happen to us without his permission. 
He is the only one who can give life and take life. And as his people, our life are in his hands. And there is no other place more secure than in the hands of Jesus Christ. The authority that the Father has given to Christ includes giving eternal life to all his people, to those who trust their lives to him. And once we put our faith in Jesus and trust our life to him, he gives us eternal life, a loving relationship with him that will never end. And Jesus assures us of this. In John 6, verse 47, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has eternal life. Not may have eternal life, but has eternal life. Not will have eternal life, but has eternal life. What does it mean? It means that eternal life with Jesus starts from the time we believe in him, when we put our faith in him and trust our life to him. It starts from that very moment to eternity. It doesn't start in the future, but in the present time. What is eternal life? Jesus said in verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is about knowing God, knowing Christ more and more, having a personal and loving relationship with God for eternity, where we grow in knowing God and in loving Him. And the more we know God in all His perfection, the more we love Him. And the more we love Him, the more we want to know Him. So this is an eternal and beautiful life with God. Number three, Jesus wants us to know that he came to this world with the purpose to die for us, bearing the punishment of all our sins as our substitute. This is in verse four and five. Jesus wants us to know that he came to this world with the purpose to die for us, bearing the punishment of all our sins as our substitute. He say in verse four and five, I glorify you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So here Jesus has confidence to accomplish his redeeming work for us. Even though he has not carried our cross yet, he came to this world with a mission to fulfill all the laws of God and to sacrifice himself and die for us as our substitute. He has been faithful to the Father, and he knows he will accomplish his mission. He spoke of his sacrifice and that many times to his disciples. Even in that night, he told them that the hour has come. He knows what he is going to face. He knows that the cross is coming to him, and he wants us to know that in his, his entire life on earth, his purpose of coming to this world is to die for us, bearing the punishment of all our sins as our substitute. Jesus has only one life purpose, which is to sacrifice himself for us, to take hell for us so that we can have his heaven. This is his purpose in life. If Jesus asks each of us, what is your life purpose? What will be your answer to him? His purpose, his life purpose is your life. It's our life to redeem us so we can live and have eternal life with him instead of eternal death in hell. In all his life, he was faithful. He never changed his mind about sacrificing himself for us. His mind was fixed on our cross. He thought so much about us in his entire life. We are the purpose of his life. There is no other but us. And he wants us to know this well, that he came to this world to die for us, bearing the punishment of all our sins against God as our substitute. He asked the Father to be glorified in his presence with the glory that he had with the Father before the world began. He asked the Father to raise him from the dead after he died on the cross for us and to take him back to his presence in heaven and restore his glory. On the cross, Jesus lost all the glory and beauty that he had. He was covered by blood. He had no beauty. Isaiah 53 foretold that on the cross, 
Jesus will be a man of sorrow. There was no beauty or majesty or glory on him. He was despised. He was rejected, not only by man, but also by his own father. Why? Because he was treated as a great sinner, carrying all our sins on his shoulder as our substitute. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, tells us about Jesus. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, his only son, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus wants us to know that he took our sin so that he can give us his righteousness and make us righteous people of God. Charles Spurgeon, a famous theologian and pastor, said this, You stand before God as if you were Christ, because Christ stood before God as if he were you. Number four, Jesus wants us to know that the Father has given us to him. This is in verse 6 to 8. Jesus wants us to know that the Father has given us to him. He says to the Father in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Jesus has manifested the name of God to us. Now, what does manifesting or revealing God's name mean? The name of God includes the attributes or the character of God. So, revealing God's name means revealing the whole character and nature of God, all that God is. God is almighty, all-knowing, and is present everywhere. He is holy and righteous. He has no beginning and no end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus came from heaven to this world to reveal God to us. And he revealed God the Father through his teachings as well as through himself as the Son of God and the Word of God who became a man. Now, to whom does Jesus reveal God? Jesus reveals God in a special way, not to every person in this world, but only to a certain group of people. Who are the people? Jesus said in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. So there is a group of people whom the Father gave to Jesus out of the world. This group of people do not belong to the world, but belong to the Father, and the Father gave them to Jesus. This group of people is not everybody in the world, but a selected chosen group of people. They belong to the Father because the Father has given them special saving grace. God gives everyone in this world his common grace, such as the sun, the rain, and the beauty of nature that everyone can enjoy. But to a chosen group of people, the Father gives his special saving grace. The Father gives Jesus to them, and the Father gives them to Jesus. The Father gives Jesus to us, and the Father gives us to Jesus. The Father sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the punishment of all our sins as our substitute, so that by putting our faith in Christ, trusting and surrendering our life to him, we might be saved. This is God's special saving grace for us. By this special saving grace, God sends his Holy Spirit to work in us bringing our souls alive from death in sin, helping us to understand the truth of the gospel and to see the beauty of a crucified Savior on the cross. By his special saving grace, the Holy Spirit enables us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came from heaven to save us from our sins and to sacrifice himself for us as our substitute. So we are saved by God's special saving grace alone and not by our works. Even our faith is a gift from the Holy Spirit. We can put our faith in Christ because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We are saved by God's special saving grace alone, through our faith alone, and in Christ alone. Colossians 1.13 says, He, God the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. 
So we belong to the Father, and the Father has given us to Christ. In that same night when Jesus prayed this prayer, he also said, I'm going to the Father to prepare a room for you. Jesus wants us to know that we belong to him and that our home is with him in heaven. This world is not our home. We are sojourners in this world. Our permanent home is with Christ in heaven. And Jesus wants us to remember this. Number five, Jesus wants us to know that he never stops praying for us. This is in verse 9 and 10. Jesus wants us to know that he never stops praying for us. He said to the Father in verse 9, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Jesus always prays for us. He prays for us all the time because he knows our weaknesses and struggles. He never stops praying for us. There is nobody in this world who will pray for us all the time, but only Jesus. He never takes a weekend off or a vacation. He always pray for you. He's always, he's always there for you, either in the morning, in the afternoon, in the night, after midnight. You can always come to him. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't take a nap. He's always there for you. So if you are discouraged of because of any circumstances, please know that Jesus is praying for you. And at any time, if you want to talk to him, he is always there for you. When you have nobody to talk to, you can still talk to Jesus. Jesus always prays for us and is always available for us. Remember that when Jesus carried the cross to the hill to be crucified, it was not his cross that he carried. It was ours. Jesus could abandon our cross and left us dead in our sins, but he did not. He kept carrying our cross because he kept thinking about us. You were in his mind all the time when he carried your cross. He never gives up on us and he will never abandon us. He remains faithful to us even now praying for us all the time. The book of Hebrews tells that Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father, praying and mediating for his people. Hebrews 4, verse 15 and 16 tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. He is able to sympathize with our weaknesses in every respect. He is the perfect mediator between God and us, and he never stops praying, mediating, and interceding for you before God the Father. And he wants you to know this. He never stops praying for you. Number six, Jesus wants us to know that he watches over our lives. This is verse 11 and 12. Jesus wants us to know that he watches over our lives. He says to the Father in verse 11, And I am no longer in the world, but they, my people, are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Verse 12, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that, they, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So here Jesus was about to finish his redeeming work on the cross for us. He will go back to heaven to the Father and will no longer be in the world. And Jesus asked the Father to keep his people in his name. Now what does to be kept in the name of God mean? The name of God reveals his character and attributes and perfection. To be kept or protected in God's name means to be protected in God by his sovereignty, his sovereign power, wisdom, and love for us. This is the eternal security of God's people, that we are kept and protected in God's name. God is our covenant God. Whether or not we are faithful to him, he will always be faithful to us. 
God's relationship with us is a covenant relationship and is a model for our marriages. We are to be a covenant husband and a covenant wife to our spouses. Just as God is our covenant God, I will always be faithful to you regardless of your actions. We are protected by God as one covenant people of him, as one body of Christ. And Jesus prayed that all his people may be one, as he is one with the Father. He knows the evil one will attack his people from the outside and the inside. He said that he has guarded all his disciples except one, Judas, the son of destruction, because he was not one of his people. Judas was lost and destroyed because he had never repented from his sins and put his faith in Jesus Christ, trusting his life to him. Judas put his faith in money and not in Jesus. He loved money and not Jesus. He was not a born again Christian, but a false Christian who seemed to follow Jesus, but following him with a selfish reason and not following him as Lord and Savior. In John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hands. Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. He is our covenant Lord and Savior. He has laid down his life for us and he will not let anyone take us out of his hands. He watches over our life. He keeps us in God's name and he wants us to know this that he is always with us and he watches over our lives. If he allow us to face struggles in this broken world, he is still with us in our struggles and suffering. He is our good shepherd. He is our covenant savior. Number seven, lastly, Jesus wants us to know that he, is, that he always fills us with his joy. This is in verse 13. Jesus wants us to know that he always fills us with his joy. He says to the Father in verse 13, but now I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus knows that we have struggled in this world. He wants us to know all these things that he has done for us and continue doing in our present life. He wants us to know how much he loves us. And by knowing how much he loves us and all these things he does for us, we can have his joy in our hearts. Notice here, Jesus does not say that they may have their joy fulfilled in themselves, but he said that they may have whose joy? My joy fulfilled in themselves. Interesting, right? Jesus has actually said similar thing in in John 15, verse 11, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now, joy and happiness is different. Joy is different than happiness. Happiness is outward, and it depends on circumstances. If you get a nice gift for your birthday, then you are happy. But if the gift is so-so, your, your, your face may get cloudy, right? If you get good food, you are happy. If the food is not good, either too salty, too sweet, too spicy, then you might be grumbling. But joy is different. Joy is inward. It comes from knowing and trusting God in our life. And joy is one of the characteristics of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love and then what? Joy. And Jesus knows that we need His joy not our own joy. It is his own joy that, he will re that we will receive if we abide in his love. What kind of joy is Jesus' joy? It is the joy that he has in a perfect loving relationship with God the Father and the Holy Spirit from eternity. It is pure. It is unchangeable. It is unaffected by any circumstances. So think about this, it is his own joy that Jesus gives us and that kind of perfect joy will make our joy full. 
this kind of joy will not be affected by any of our circumstances. So if you have any struggles in your life, ask Jesus to give you his own joy. He wants you to know that you will receive it. He always fills us, fills our hearts with his joy. And Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So come to Jesus. Don't let your heart be troubled. Come to Jesus. Rest in him, and he will give you his own joy and peace. He loves you, and he wants you to be joyful. And only by having Jesus' joy in our hearts, we can have rest and peace for our souls no matter what's going on in our life in this broken world. So if you have not put your faith and trust your life to Christ, please do so. Your heart will continue to be unrest, weary, and burdened until you rest and trust your life in Christ. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son to save us from our sins. Thank you for protecting us daily in your name. Father, we feel secure to be in your hands because we know that you are in control of this world. May your will be done in our lives on earth as it is in heaven. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for all you have done for us and continue doing in our life. May your joy be in us, make our joy full. Thank you that we can come to you and rest in you. Teach us to love you more and more and to tell others about you and your love for them. And we pray this in your name. Amen.